gives me great pleasure to welcome Eric Hanushek here to CIS, all the way from the Hoover Institution in California, uh, where he is the Paul and Jean Hanna Senior Fellow. Among many honours that, that Rick has been awarded over the years, uh, he was awarded the very prestigious Yidan Prize for Education Research in 2019. Uh, and he's the author among, of many, many scholarly works and reports to governments and international organisations. But perhaps most prescient to this conversation today, uh, he's the co-author of, of a, very, uh, a very interesting book, from, in my view, uh, known as The Knowledge Capital of Nations, which is a, it seeks to explain the, story, the, the historical story of the wealth of nations through an education lens. And that's, and that's why many would recognise him as being uh, the world's leading education economist, and, and I think that's that's a title he's very much earned. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Eric Hanyashek. I'm your breakfast entertainment. Um, <laughs> I'm an economist by training, and when I started into uh, academic life for doing my dissertation, <clears throat> economists didn't really look at education at all. And uh, over time, uh, more and more economists have realized that education is the foundation of many of the things we talk about. It's the foundation of uh, productivity changes and enhancements in economies, of innovation. The well-being of nations uh, comes from economic growth. And economic growth, in my uh, analysis is almost entirely about education. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the evidence behind that, and it's really to set up then discussions, uh, perhaps, of what uh, kinds of policies might be appropriate or what might, might be done to improve education. This is uh, Glenn's title for me, Smart Nation, Richer Future. The first thing I'll talk about is something that I think all of you know. The fact is that people who know more earn more on average. Um, and so what I've given you is a graph here that on the horizontal axis is countries that were surveyed uh, actually about 10 years ago now, uh, <clears throat> where there was a random sample of people of all throughout the entire age range. And it asked people, what are you doing today? What's your job? How much are you paid? And importantly, it gave them a math and a reading test of people that were out in the workforce. And so what this graph does is relate the scores on the reading test to the earnings that people get. And it differs by country. So at one end, um, at the, let me start at the top end. At the, top, at the left hand side is Singapore, which reward skills more than every other country. The vertical axis is the, essentially the rate of return to uh, more, more math knowledge. Um, and it goes down to, nobody ever objects to the uh, far bottom corner is Greece. Um, they don't do much that's right, uh, apparently, anymore. <laughs> but there's Australia that's sitting right in the middle of this. And it's not the highest rewards to skills, but it's not the lowest. And what this says is that uh, a standard deviation higher in achievement of these math tests uh, gives you 20% more lifetime earnings. That's what this says. A standard deviation is that if you uh, uh, the difference between the person in the middle of the distribution and somebody at the 84th percentile, basically. Um, and that's worth 20% more throughout one's life. We'll read that backwards, uh, which I'll do a little bit. Um, if you have lower skills, it, that's the penalty you get for having lower skills is 20% uh, less income. So that's half of the story I want to tell you. The other half that I want to tell you is that it's not just what happens to individuals, but nations are in fact dependent upon the skills of their workforce. And what we know now, and what Glenn 
mention the, the book that my co-author Ludger Woosman and I uh, put together tries to document the case that almost all of the differences in growth rates across countries can be explained by the skill of the population. And the skills of the population are measured pretty well by just scores on international math tests. So I think many of you know the PISA test. The PISA test is run by the OECD and now has 75 or 76 nations that take it. And what they do is take a math problem, put it in the local language, and march it around the world and see how many people can solve different math problems. And out of that, to get a pretty good measure, we'll come back to, of the skills of the population. And what you get is a, is a simple line like this, where on the horizontal axis is, think of these as PISA scores, and the vertical axis is the annual growth rate in per capita GDP. And again, it's growth that makes for the improvements in the well-being of society over time. Growth is the engine. And what you see is that countries fall on rather a straight line. It, it says conditional, by the way. The only thing behind this is that there's an adjustment made for the starting income level of countries. And that's pretty obvious. If you start behind, how do you grow? Well, you do what Japan did and what China has done. You copy what the uh, well, more developed countries do, and you can grow fast by just copying. And if you start ahead, you've got to invent new things. You've got to decide on new ways to produce. But what you see is that you've got Peru and South Africa and the Philippines at the bottom, and you've got Singapore and Taiwan at the top. And just the math scores explain three quarters of the variation in growth rates across countries over the 40 year period that we looked at from 1960 to 2000. And for a variety of reasons that I won't go into today, I think you can assume that this is really a causal relationship in that if a country improves its achievement, it will grow faster. And there's evidence of that. Okay, so let me bring this back down to, to earth here. Here's, here is PISA scores for 2018. Um, there's been another test in 2022, but the results won't be known until December. In 2003, the math scores were up near the top of the world scale. And there's been this steady decline that has taking place. What I'm going to <coughs> say is, is very simple. You, you already know that decline is extraordinarily costly to Australia and will cost the nation in the future by having lower growth rates, lower skilled people who get uh, lower, less income because of their lower skills, and that if this continues, it doesn't bode well for the, for the general future of Australia. One of the things that I've recently done with, uh, again, Ludger Wussmann and uh, a graduate student in Germany, is to try to estimate around the world of who, um, what proportion of the population of every country in the world is prepared to participate in a modern society. Okay, and we take a very simple uh, definition of this, a quantitative definition. PISA test is given to 15-year-olds. And so take the following problem. I flew to Sydney from California. I paid $3,200 for my ticket. The exchange rate between the dollar and the Australian dollar is, is 1 to 0.6. How much did my ticket cost in Australian dollars? Not, not really a stretch problem, right? For a, you expect 15-year-olds to be able to solve that problem. Um, it turns out that that's not the case. In Australia, 21% of the 15-year-olds 
who are in school cannot reliably solve that problem. You might ask, what were they doing in those nine years that they were in school if they can't reliably solve a simple uh, equation like that? Uh, but that has rather dire implications for their future and um, for, I think, Australia. Now, let me go back to the uh, graph I gave you of the total scores and look at what would happen if, uh, if we compare the expected earnings of somebody graduate or in a 15-year-old or, or graduating around the turn of the century, around the 2003 scores compared to today. Today's youth are going to be penalized 6% for the lower achievement that we see. 6% less lifetime earnings. Think of it in, as an increase in income tax of 6% on people who happen to go to school today as opposed to happen to have gone 20 years ago. Um, so that's, that's sort of the story. Let me add it all up and, and then we can talk about this. I mentioned uh, the 21% who can't reliably solve that exchange rate problem. If, according to historical patterns of, of growth, if in fact you eliminated that 21% so that everybody, all the 15 year olds in the country could reliably solve that exchange rate problem, the increase in growth rates, according to historical patterns, in today's dollars terms for the, for the economist, uh, present value terms discounted it back to today, um, and so we give less weight to things way out in the future. Um, it's 165% one, uh, of today's GDP would be the gains if you could, in fact, over the next 15 years, get to a point of eliminating those deficits in knowledge at the bottom end. Or if we thought about it, across the rest of the century, it would be on average a 4% higher GDP per capita for the entire rest of the century by eliminating that bottom end. What if you got the average in Australia back, not to, not to 2000, but to 2009? So just go back to the scores that, were exist, that existed in 2009 the impact on growth of that would be such that the value of future growth for the rest of the century would be over three times the current GDP. I'll stop there. And, and that's, that's the message that uh, Glenn wanted me to give you to, to uh, wake you up. Thanks very much, Rick. Uh, but I want to just first, Rick, kind of go back to the very beginning. And you got involved in the study of education economics why was this not a field of study that was attractive and dominating the economics profession? Well, I think that um, economists said, we don't know much about education. We'll, we'll, we'll give that to the educators to do. And um, at that time, there was very little measurement of what people knew and the importance of this, so that people spent a lot of time looking simply at how, how many years of schooling did people attain and think of investments in years of schooling. Um, it turns out that years of schooling is a very, very poor measure of the skills of the population. Um, it, the picture I showed you about growth rates as a function of PISA scores or test scores, once you include in any statistical analysis the measure of what people know, by whether they can solve math problems and so forth. Knowing the years of schooling has no impact on growth rates. It, it doesn't show up because it's what people know, not how long they've sat in schools. Um, and so trying, economists took a while to understand that you shouldn't just pay attention to the simple measures of years of schooling. I think you more or less 
coined or responsible for in, in a paper back in, I guess it's the 80s, I think, uh, around the failure of inputs-based policies in education. But there still seem to be a lot of decisions in education <coughs> made based on inputs. Um, Why would that be? Uh, well, this is... Uh, there have been a number of things that I've said that people don't like <laughs> particularly. Um, one is that there simply is very little systematic relationship between how much you spend on schools and what kids learn. Um, and it's, um, <clears throat> that's the, obviously a, a statement that has to be qualified in a variety of ways. What I'm trying to look at is we, we know that a bunch of things outside of schools are really important for what kids know. Families are important, neighborhoods and other things. But allowing for all the other background information, then you look at what's, what did the schools add? And what the schools added is not, by uh, many, many studies, very closely related to what's being spent. Um, now, this gets into a few controversial areas where uh, that includes such things as overall teacher salaries and it includes things such as uh, class size, which are the common uh, vocabulary of policy discussions that um, shouldn't we pay teachers more? They're not earning, uh, not paid sufficiently for their job. Shouldn't we have smaller classes? Well, it turns out that um, in the United States and now in studies in a n large number of other countries of the world, um, salaries aren't very closely related to effectiveness in the classroom uh, because salaries are rad rather rigidly set by such things as experience and degree levels. And then class size probably makes a difference at some level. I mean, when I was teaching at the university, I always used to tell my department chairman that I'd do much better if I had a small class. Um, uh, and tried to convince my department chairman of that. Um, but in reality, um, within the ranges that we see in most schools, um, the effectiveness of the teacher just swamps the number of kids in the school. But we spend money on all of these things in ways that um, doesn't lead to increased performance as opposed to, um, I'm actually a big spender on schools. I mean, I'm, I, I'm one who advocates more spending, but spending for performance. Um, spending when we see effective teachers, I want to pay effective teachers more and I want to pay ineffective teachers less. For those in industry, that's a pretty common, that's a pretty easy equation to make, but in education, that's kind of heresy. Uh, well, <clears throat> I don't get to in invited to educator lunches, breakfasts and lunches very frequently, I, sh I should say. Um, uh, every once in a while, they do when they want a little re relief or they have somebody uh, who's designed to, to uh, offset my uh, statements. Um, it is the case that systematically we have uh, a system that doesn't think about uh, incentives for performance the way industry would know it's doing. Um, we have a few examples where it happens. Um, in the United States, uh, Washington, D.C., which has a pretty bad school system in general, uh, 10 years ago started paying huge bonuses, really large bonuses to the best teachers and firing the worst teachers. And you can see it in the data that all of a sudden Washington schools start getting better over time when they did that. The same, and I've been spending a lot of time in Dallas, Texas, um, which is about the 10th or 11th largest city in the United States. And they <coughs> did the same thing, that they, they changed the way they evaluated both principals and teachers and paid people according to their effectiveness basically in producing higher achievement. And the city schools 
uh, in Dallas improved from way below the state average, being a large urban district, up to the state average. I'm giving you the stories of two districts out of 13,500 districts in the United States. It's not something that people, even when you see the evidence about performance, jump to. I, I, I want to <coughs> zero in on something else in Dallas because I know that you know that system quite well. Uh, the better Australia, we've 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 spent the better part of two decades, or more than a decade, uh, but but some work in ahead of that, focusing on what what's described as a needs-based funding system. This means that uh, schools that with disadvantaged cohorts receive significantly more funding per student, uh, and it's a per student-based formula, and in many ways works that way and, and delivers that. Mm -hmm. uh, Disappointingly, it's done very little to narrow gaps and, and so on, uh, as you would have alluded to. Uh, but it seems to me that the, the error we seem to have made there is we adjusted needs-based funding on the input side, but didn't change the composition of the available workforce in schools. If I understand uh, an approach in Dallas has been specifically that, that is taking the most valuable resources in, in teachers to the most needy schools. Can you describe a little bit about that? Yeah, let me, let me describe quick. What Dallas did in 2013, it completely revamped the evaluation system for principals and teachers. And partly it used information on student test scores, but mainly it used information on supervisory ratings in a um, very uh, well-designed rubric of, of evaluations, like 10 times a year, there were um, unannounced 15-minute visits to all the classrooms, and then a couple longer visits to classrooms. And they also surveyed students and teachers as part of the evaluation. They developed this system so that you could then um, compare the effectiveness of teachers across all of the teachers in Dallas, except for new teachers that didn't have any history. Um, and then uh, they were worried about the fact that if you paid according to these evaluations, uh, it might be harder to get a good evaluation if you were in the worst schools. If you were in very uh, disadvantaged schools, low achieving, uh, single parent families, all the uh, things that go into it, um, that it might be more difficult. So they experimented with a system that would pay bonuses for teachers who went to the most disadvantaged schools, but the bonuses were based upon their prior effectiveness. So that the most uh, effective teachers in their rankings got um, a ten thousand dollar a year bonus on a, about a sixty thousand dollar a year average for the district. The next rank got eight thousand dollars a year bonus uh, on the same thing, and then the sort of middle teachers got a six thousand dollar a year bonus. They they discovered two things when they did this. One is effective teachers like more money and they were willing to go through the worst schools. And so the entire distribution of effectiveness of the teacher force just moved when they had these bonuses. And in two years, the very worst schools in Dallas came up to the, to the district average. They ran a, a second experiment like this and got the same results. Two years, the scores jump. And then, um, and this, is, this comes back to the problems of governance and decision making, two things were, uh, went on. The district recognized they were paying more for these schools and they were faced with budgetary problems. And secondly, because the schools had gotten better, they were no longer the ones that should get the bonuses. So they removed most of the bonuses. Uh, yes, <laughs> you figured it out. <laughs> the most effective teachers went someplace else, and the scores came back down. Oh, as soon as you took away the rewards for being in these systems. So um, the Dallas 
system tells many stories, um, but they, they tell to me a story of hope in that we know how we can, in fact, solve some of these problems. Um, if, I, if I gave you the why to my uh, normal presentation here after I tell you the, the challenges that Australia faces and ask, well, what, what do we know about policies that work? Um, I always have three policies that I think are most important. The first one is, is hire effective teachers in all the classrooms. The second one is hire effective teachers in the classrooms. And the third one is hire effective teachers in the classrooms. I mean, this is, I, I think we have huge amounts of research to suggest that effective teachers are miracle workers and can in fact get uh, high achievement. But you have to pay attention to who the miracle workers are. Not, not everybody um, is eligible for sainthood. That's, um, so what I'm hearing from the, the Dallas example you've described is, um, I guess, something you wouldn't say again in education conferences, but basically that the labor market responds to it. Uh, but, but, does the, but the market does not seem to be able to identify and select effectiveness very well. Um, <clears throat> I think what's the, what I, the way I read the, um, all of the evidence is that it's really hard to guess who's going to be a good teacher before they're in the classroom. That knowing what school they went to and what their grades were and, and how much they smile at the initial interview doesn't give you a, a good indication of who is going to do well in the classroom. So that the market, if it's based entirely upon incoming uh, potential teachers is not very good at sorting it out. Uh, my other <coughs> sort of normal story, it's probably over, it, it overstates the actual evidence, but that um, uh, it takes very little time in any school to know who are the most effective teachers. The principals know who the most effective teachers are. The other teachers all know who the most effective teachers are. Um, the parents often generally know, the students know, and probably the janitor knows. I mean, uh, um, that it, it's not a mystery um, as I see it, who the most effective teachers are and who the least effective teachers are. There's a lot of confusion in the middle of the distribution uh, there, but knowing who the most effective teachers are and the least effective um, allows you, if you use that information, to in fact uh, get huge improvements. Well, the sector generally looks at uh, tenure of being in the field. Ten the sector very much rewards and values tenure as being important. Obviously, it plays a role, but uh, and the qualifications that the teachers have, including postgraduate qualifications. Are these very good proxies for effectiveness? Um, you know, this is a little bit country specific, but in the United States, there is absolutely no correlation between having a graduate degree in education and effectiveness in the classroom. None. Um, partly by, because of the reward system. The reward system in the United States is if you have a master's degree, you get paid 15 or 20 percent per year. This, in fact, induces lots of people to get master's degrees. The clear master's degree of choice is an education leadership degree, training you to be an education leader, uh, because the degree has, uh, in most education schools, little substance behind it, uh, and it doesn't d uh, distract from uh, most of your daily life if you take a master's degree while teaching and, and do that, and you don't have to actually be an education leader to get the, the bonus for the degree. Experience, it turns out, has 
uh, real value in the first two or three years. People learn the craft a lot more in the first two or three years. Um, but after year three or so, um, experience appears to be quite unrelated to effectiveness in the classroom. Some more experienced teachers are good, some aren't. And that's, that's what you should address. We'll come to questions in the audience in, in a few minutes, but I want to maybe push back on the thesis about knowledge capital a little bit and suggest what if, you know, that the story in effect is that, that you've presented is that smart countries become rich countries. You highlight, you, you touched on the idea about causality there earlier, but wouldn't it be the case that rich countries can afford good education systems and this is why they appear smarter? Have, what, what's the, do you, are you convinced that there's a causation in your direction? Yeah, I'm, I'm quite convinced uh, that it's causal. If you, if you arrayed um, all of the OECD countries, the, the club is rich, the, um, uh, by spending per student, um, and, and growth in, sp you can use growth in spending per student over the last 10 years and the change in international PISA scores or, or the other international tests, what you see is just a cloud. There's no line points who would connect each point and suggest that spending more uh, gets you um, better performance. Um, the U.S. is second or third in the world in terms of spending per pupil, and you saw that it's um, uh, about four, four ranks below Australia on the 2018 chart that I gave you. So, uh, again, I'll, I'll perhaps just challenge the thesis a little bit again. Um, is, do we still need knowledge capital in advanced economy that we see today? You know, we've got artificial intelligence, automations, all of this sort of stuff. Do we still need human capital? Well, there's been a lot of discussion, I mean, particularly since the uh, public release of Chat GPT, that, that um, well, maybe this replaces uh, skilled workers. You just have anybody can go to Chat GPT and, and ask it what to do. Um, I actually view AI like uh, a number of economic changes that have occurred in the past, from the Industrial Revolution uh, to more manufacturing-based, replacing agriculture and so forth. Um, I think that in all of those cases, skills of people have become more valuable, not less valuable, as there have been improvements in the economy in various ways. And my own prediction is that skills will, will be rewarded higher, skilled people, as take my measure of skills if you want, uh, skilled people will get higher rewards in the AI of the future of the world. It's gonna help lots of people in general, but there's gonna be higher value um, to the more skilled people in the future. And so I, um, the, the one important caveat to that, I think, is that the uh, introduction of robots and, and AI and so forth has been perhaps more rapid than the prior changes in the economy that we've seen with industrialization and, uh, and movement to information, the movement to computers and so forth. Uh, the advent of computers certainly made people with more skills more valued. Um, and I think that this is, is an extension of that. But the rapidity is of concern for countries because uh, while on average skills will be rewarded more, there are going to be displacements of people that, uh, whose job is no longer equal to that of um, the, the mechanized version of you. Um, the, the reason why, by the way, that, that everybody in, in my business is so ex excited and nervous about AI is discussions about how AI can replace lawyers. They're much better at looking up things than lawyers. Um, they're uh, much better than radiologists in reading many mammograms and things like that. 
uh, and things starting to hit white collar workers. The, the previous uh, in, inventions were much uh, more aimed at other parts of the market and white collar workers were pretty immune. And now people are getting excited. Here's, here's an invention that might affect our labor market. <laughs> Uh, so we've got a question. Please get your words ready so I can come to you in a moment. But just, just I suppose I want to push back in one other area that Australian policymakers maybe view this issue with some complacency, and that's that, okay, all well and good if our school system might be lagging, but as a high immigration advanced economy, we can import knowledge capital from the, around the world. Please. Um, <laughs> that sounds like a... a um, an argument that I address in the United States where we're having all kinds of debates about immigration. High skilled immigration is always good. Get somebody else to pay for that, uh, those skills and knowledge and bring it in and use it. Um, and so uh, the question is, is it sufficient first to make up for the falls between 2003 and 2018? And it's doubtful that even at your immigration, that if you do the averaging right, you still got that. The largest component is still your own people. And, and bringing your own people up to that level is important. Secondly, uh, you don't want to uh, send your low, own people off to the low paying jobs. Um, if even if you could bring in enough people, it probably would not be politically or socially acceptable to say, "Well, sorry, all you old-time Australians, uh, we've got we've got better workers here, and we're going to replace you." Uh, now, f from the from the audience, uh, yeah, sure, uh, Ray, first up. Have you encountered this phenomenon where that I've been told in? Relation to education, police, and the fire brigade, uh, you get young young people come in and they get brownie points for courses on uh, inclusion and uh, affirmative action and all those things. Now the old hands treat these things with contempt and don't do them, and they play off in animation. Uh, I'm I'm trying to to see whether you can drag me into this political swamp. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm resisting being dragged into this political swamp. Uh, you know, we have, in fact, uh, uh, all kinds of, of social values going on that um, drive lots of our political decisions and our drive educational decisions. They are not necessarily the things that lead to um, higher PISA scores. Um, and my concern in the United States, and I won't speak to Australia, but my concern in the United States is that discussions of inclusion and diversity and so forth are just sucking out all the air in the room and leaving discussions of um, what kids are learning to the side. And I think that, that that's a problem, not, not um, addressing directly the social values that I think are, are, are good in many of these discussions, but it's not good to um, treat that as the only uh, outcome. There, well, well done. Be swerved there, well, well done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up, uh, Sylvia. Thank you, Eric. It was a, a great, uh, great presentation. So Silvia Griselda, uh, research manager at E61. I was wondering if you can uh, tell us a little bit more, given that we don't have the recipe for what is a, what makes a good teacher, what happened when we moved the effective teachers from the best school to the worst school in the sense like, obviously we see that the worst school tend to improve, but what happened to the best school? Do they um, start... Uh, <coughs> going worse or is there some sort of permanent uh, um, human capital and what happened once the effective teachers move out of the before uh, worse yeah. teacher is there some fading out 
So it, it's complicated, but if, if you had been exactly the same teacher force and it didn't change and you just took the best teachers and put them in the worst schools, on, in general you'd end up with a zero-sum answer that you're subtracting away from the one school to, in fact, take care of the other school. There's a little bit that that's not correct. In the sense that um, you're providing better working conditions in these schools, so that many of these schools had very bad working conditions. You, you bring them together and they do better than they would have. You know, the, the working conditions on average for the district improve. But the hope and, and what you see is a little bit of evidence in Washington, D.C. that's been operating in Walker is that you start getting a better um, supply of teachers into the schools. Um, now, for the, for the Dallas district, it can get a better supply by either getting a better group of people that want to be in teaching in general or stealing teachers from the surrounding areas. So you've got this fill the same summing up problem uh, if you're just stealing teachers from the surrounding areas. But I think the evidence that it's not entirely clear, but the evidence is that there are a number of people who would much prefer working in a job where they're paid according to their own performance as opposed to a job where they aren't. Um, then currently, Teaching doesn't pay you for your own performance. It pays you for how long you've been around and in degree levels. Um, and there are a number of people. Um, in, in fact, I would use that as a definition of what a professional is. A professional is somebody who is willing to be uh, compensated for my performance. And that I think professionalizing the teaching force um, is an important thing, and you get a different group of people who want to be professionals if you, in fact, um, say that we're going to reward you for, for how well you perform. And most of us in this room, I, I assert, are in that category, that you are happier to be a, being recognized for doing a good job as opposed to being somebody with a given occupation on, that's stamped on your shirt. We'll have time for probably two questions. Uh, so next up, we'll go to Matt. Uh, Matt Crocker from the Susan McKinnon Foundation. I was quite struck by your statistic that I think it was 21% of students weren't prepared for a, for a modern economy uh, and the impact of just addressing that. So is your view that from a kind of education policy lens, we should be focusing on bringing up the bottom 20% or more focusing on how do we improve the system overall? Um, I think it's both. Uh, One of the problems of education is that we have multiple objectives of the education system. And one is um, overall learning, uh, and the other is distributional and the, the uh, bringing up the bottom end and, and some responsibility for not um, not prolonging um, poor performance in, in families. I mean, if, to the extent that low-income families and low-educated families in general don't provide the same services to their kids as high-income families, you see it in the schools that um, uh, in general, poor kids are signing with a different damage. And I think my view of society, a good society, is one that tries to break the linkage of, with um, family background and tries to help out people who came into this world with less advantages, um, less advantages than I had. Yeah. And so I, I think you've got both of those going on at the same time. I think that there, um, we, can't, we can't have policies only aimed at one of those. Now, improving the whole system, I think, takes care of both of them at the same time. But in general, when you have these two different objectives, you have to have 
um, a couple of different brands to deal with the different objectives, or you end up losing one for the ad advantage of the other. Uh, just a final one from the floor, uh, Min Kang. Thank you very much for um, giving us a really challenging question. Um, we hear, I think, um, see things, uh, data seriously and think about how we can improve. But strangely, uh, many educational researchers in Australia do not accept the data coming from OECD um, and they don't take it seriously. So they don't really see where it's really the problem. Um, there is kind of some complacency. We don't really need to fix it. We're still doing well. And it is not uh, just those kind of educational researches. When we meet some of the parents, um, they really do not know uh, that there is this declining performance. And um, even though we sometimes tell them you may get better quality education with the same price you pay for. Sometimes they're very angry. Tell me you go back to where you were from. I'm from very competitive South Korea. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my question is, how can we raise the awareness um, of this problem to the public and to the public understand what this data means to them? Well, part of the problem of education is that the results really aren't seen for a while. You know, the, the um, knowing that somebody can divide fractions is, has very little meaning to, to parents in general. That, you know, my fifth grader is, is struggling with dividing fractions. Does that really matter? Um, you know, uh, and it's only after a long period of time that you start seeing the results, and even then it's hard to tell because you have to sort through the differences between individuals and the skills they have uh, or could have had. Um, uh, so my general answer is that you should always listen to the good economists on this. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> because, in fact, um, it, it's, it can only be... Uh, Observe in later on over a long period of time, um, and you know it. I think it would be a mistake to just write off that picture that showed South Africa and Peru at one end of the growth line, and Singapore and Taiwan at the other. Um, you have to say, well, that to there's something else going on that everybody falls on this straight line. What could it possibly be to do that? Now, that's the fundamentally the job, uh, in my opinion, of a combination of government and CIS. Um, you've got researchers and you've got government to, to try to aggregate the information and make, make these decisions and make it public why you're making those decisions. It's not something that individual parents can do. They can't run the statistical analyses to, to find out the, the value of being able to divide fractions. Um, but in fact, um, you want school leaders, you want the government, you want the think tanks of Australia to in fact provide the scientific evidence, the best evidence. One of the things that we have today is extraordinarily deep and thorough information on many of these things. It's a matter of putting out in a way that, that people can digest it. Unfortunately, that is all we've got time for this morning. I think it's a very good place to, to end things. Uh, and I think a takeaway to always listen to the good economists. <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking uh, Eric Hendershek. <laughs> Thank you. Now, for decades, CIS has been a fiercely independent voice, working tirelessly to deliver evidence-based public policy, especially in the critical area of education. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell. 
CIS relies solely on the generosity of people like you to help us advance our cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved.